Welcome to the first of four lectures for chapter 37. And in this chapter, we're going to be looking at World War II. And in the last section, we'll look at the impact of World War II. So in this section, we're going to be looking at the origins of World War II. So this covers chapter 37, section one in your AP World History textbook. And I'm going to start by giving you a question. So I'll go through a series of questions so that as you see the following slides, you'll try to focus in on understanding how to answer that question. So the first question we're going to look at is for you to be able to explain the reasons for Japan's desires to expand, as well as the steps they took to build an empire. So you should be able to explain this in writing, right? So to help you do that, you want to listen to the next few slides. So J Japan begins its expansion in 1931, and some historians point to this as the beginning of World War II, or at least the, the, the road to war, begins with the action Japan begins to take. In 1931, they invade Manchuria, which is in northern China, in hopes of building an empire for themselves. They call it the East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. We talked a little bit about it during the age of imperialism. But as Japan was industrializing and now it's rapidly building up its military, it needs raw materials that it doesn't have on the islands of Japan and seeks colonies on the mainland of Asia. When it invades Manchuria, the League of Nations get tested for the first time. And they condemn Japan's actions. And in that middle image, you see the conference being held and the Japanese representative stands up and basically orders his delegates, delegates to walk out. Japan doesn't like the way they are addressed and they are told they cannot take these actions. So they withdraw from the League of Nations and they stage a walkout. They just walk straight out of the room and leave the League of Nations. And this was the first time the League of Nations that was created after World War I gets tested, right? And this exposed the weakness of the League of Nations, which is that it has no backbone. There's nothing it could do to back up its actions. It could tell a country like Japan that it should not be invading sovereign territories, but then there's nothing they can do to enforce any decisions. And so this emboldens Japan to continue to seek land because, well, nothing happened. They left the League of Nations and there was no consequence. So in 1937, they launched a full-scale invasion of the rest of China as they begin to build their empire. And you can see this map here with the red outline showing you the Pacific Islands that Japan brought under its control, as well as the land in northern China and Manchuria, and then along coastal China, and then down into the French colony of Indonesia, right? So it into Vietnam. Um, and this becomes part of the Japanese, this growing Japanese empire under the militarist empire. One of the atrocities out of this war was the rape of Nanjing that takes place when they invade China. 400 civilians in the city of Nanjing are used for bayonet practice. And over 7,000 women are raped in Nanjing. A third of the homes are destroyed. And this becomes symbolic of Japan's ruthless actions uh, towards, the, towards the Chinese. Actions that still carry a lot of weight. There's still a lot of, of bitterness and resentment between China and Japan uh, stemming back to, to this war. Within China, there were resistance movements. Um, the communists and the nationalists who had been competing for each other since the collapse of the Qing dynasty in 1911, temporarily form a united front. They unite against Japan. But because of the instability that China had been under since the fall of the Qing dynasty, they're not strong enough to drive the Japanese out. So they resist through guerrilla tactics, guerrilla attacks. Um, but ultimately, the communists and nationalists are not able to work together to drive Japan out. So China is temporarily governed then throughout the remainder of World War II by the Japanese using Chinese collaborators. So then Tokyo or Japan forms an alliance with Italy and with Germany, the Tripartite Pact is signed in 1940. And that's known as the Tokyo-Rome-Berlin Axis. So this is now 
creating alliances just like we saw before World War I. In 1941, they signed a neutrality pact with the Soviet Union to not go to war with the USSR. So we see Japan's expansion being, you know, carried out here through the invasion of China, the, the islands of the, the Pacific. And again, this was to try to build an empire seeking raw materials that it needs for its rapid industrialization. For the second question, we'll look at the actions of Italy. So be able to explain the motives for Italy's aggression in Africa and the response by other European powers to Italy's actions. So Italy never fully recovered from World War I. And Italy never also gained the territory they wanted from the Treaty of Versailles. So there was disappointment in the Treaty of Versailles. Mussolini, like you'd seen in the previous chapter, in or chapter 35, before we went on break, Mussolini promised national glory, and he promised an empire. And so he begins taking action and aggression by annexing Libya. Mussolini's motives are more along the lines of nationalism, right? He wants to build a big empire the way the British, the French, the Germans had, um, had done. During the age of imperialism, Italy suffered an embarrassing loss to Ethiopia. Embarrassing for them, right? Because at that time, right, it was the only European nation that was defeated by an African nation while the rest of Africa was brought under European control. So Mussolini also wants to be able to regain that, that prestige. And so by taking land in Africa, they annex Libya. And then between 1935 and 36, they invade Ethiopia. And 200,000 Ethiopians are killed. And so in order to invade Ethiopia, Mussolini has to go through the Red Sea, right? They have to send ships through the Suez Canal. And that canal was controlled by the British. So it would have been very easy for the British to have stopped Mussolini, right? Knowing he's going to invade an African country, but having been exhausted from war in World War I, the British allowed Mussolini's military ships to go through the Suez Canal, and Italy begins its invasion and its takeover of Ethiopia. And so that, so those are the actions that Mussolini took. And again, when the emperor of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie, petitions to the League of Nations, nothing is done, right? There, there is nothing that could be done there's no, no protocols within the League of Nations that allow it to take military action. And so as Ethiopia appealed to the League of Nations for support, they didn't get the support they needed. So again, the weaknesses of the League of Nations are exposed. And now we're starting to see a pattern. And so then the next person to test is, is going to be Adolf Hitler. So your third question is to explain the actions that Hitler took that violated the Treaty of Versailles as well as his motives, right? Now, again, the Germans signed a treaty that was very harsh on Germany. After World War I, the, the terms le left Germany really um, devastated. You could see this, this painting in the middle here showing Woodrow Wilson, George Clemenceau holding the, the guillotine there, and David Lloyd George of England, right, about to decapitate the Germans. And the harsh terms of the Treaty of Versailles led the Allies to ignore Hitler's violations. When Adolf Hitler comes to power, remember we talked about this in, in Chapter 35, he promised the Germans he was going to undo the Treaty of Versailles. He promised he was going to rebuild the military. Right, all these terms that, that Germany had to abide by, Hitler says, no, that's what's holding us back. So when Hitler begins to break and violate the treaty, the Allies are inclined to ignore it because they realized by then, by 1930, they'd realized that the, the treaty was very unfair to the Germans. Hitler had blamed the Jews, the communists, and the liberals for losing the war, and he uses that war and the hatred towards the Treaty of Versailles and towards the defeat of World War I to also 
begin the propaganda campaigns against people he's going to persecute. So in 1933, Hitler withdraws from the League of Nations, and he announces he will not continue with the Treaty of Versailles. And one of those terms that, vi that the Treaty of Versailles had placed on Germany was it was not allowed to have a large military. Its army had to remain limited to 100,000 soldiers. And there, was all these, all, there were all these stipulations on that they couldn't have a navy, they couldn't have an air force. And under Hitler, remember, this is during the Great Depression, Hitler's promising to create jobs, and he begins, begins creating jobs, building up his war machine. And so he built an air force of 4,500 airplanes. He recruits 1.5 million soldiers into the army, right? An army that was only supposed to have 100,000. And as this military's building is buildup is going out, you hear people, diplomats that visit Germany and go back to their home countries and they get asked about, well, you know, what do you think about what Hitler's doing and violating the treaty? A lot of people were impressed with Hitler. They were impressed with the efficiency of the organization of, you know, making tanks and making airplanes and recruiting troops. He impressed a lot of people, right? That They had no idea he was planning an invasion of Europe. He, he was planning to build an empire of a master race, right? So there were a lot of people who, you know, from Britain, from the United States, from Canada, from, from you know, not so much France. France was always very skeptical. But there were other countries around who really saw Hitler as someone who was doing something good for his country by creating jobs and bringing it out of the Depression. So the buildup of the military violates the Treaty of Versailles. In 1936, he invades the Rhineland. He sends troops into the Rhineland. The Rhineland was supposed to be a buffer zone between Germany and France after World War I, where the Germans were not allowed to have any military bases or military to, for the French to feel secure. Hitler violates it by sending troops into the Rhineland, and again, France is alarmed. The Treaty of Versailles also stipulated that Germany cannot have an alliance with Austria. And so there you see to its south, it has Austria, and to the south, uh, southeast, it has Czechoslovakia. In 1938, Hitler carries out the Anschluss, the annexation of Austria. Right, that painting there shows the Anschluss. This is the keystone, this bridge between the Austrian people and the Germans. Remember, Hitler was born in Austria, and the people in Austria are ethnically German and linguistically German. So he's promising to unite the German speaking people. So he also begins to want the lands that border Germany with Czechoslovakia, where a lot of the people living there were Germans. They were called Sudeten Germans. And the area, the border that you see in this map highlighted in peak, is called the Sudetenland. And in 1938, Hitler reclaims the Sudetenland. So he's taking land from Czechoslovakia, a country that was created. All of these are violations of the Treaty of Versailles. And it's kind of like at every step of, of the way, every time Hitler violates an aspect of the treaty, he's told, hey, hey, what are you doing? But then nothing happens. So he's learning very quickly that nothing is being done when he violates the treaty. And so in October, he says that the Czechs must give the Germans territory immediately or, or, or the Germans will take the Czech territory themselves. And he also says he wants peace with Lenin, right? He's all, this is, this is the last demand. I will not take anything else, right? So after the affairs in the Sudetenland, Hitler says, look, I'm just trying to unite the Germans. That's all I want. After I get this, I just want Czechoslovakia. And after I get that, I'm done, right? I don't want anything else. And so this becomes known as the Munich Conference. The Prime Minister of, of Great Britain, Neville Chamberlain, flies to Germany to meet with Hitler. And he signs an agreement. Right? They, they go and they say, okay, Hitler, you can take the Sudetenland. You can have the land on the border, right? And he's appeased. Here's the map showing the shaded areas. Hitler can have those shaded areas, but he has to promise to stop invading. So Hitler signs a letter and Neville Chamberlain returns to England saying, you know, I've secured peace in our time. We have made this agreement. We 
you know, we brought peace, right? We're not going to war again like we did in World War I. And so this was the Munich Conference, and you can see it signed here September 30th, 1938. And he's holding this piece of paper, right, telling the British, you know, we've secured peace in our time. So there's a lot of, of historical speculation around this event uh, of whether he was fooled by Hitler or whether knowing they had let Hitler get away with too much, that the British were not quite prepared to go to war and was buying time. Right. So there are there are some historians who look at this event as Neville Chamberlain realizing that they messed up early on by not stopping Hitler before he built up his military. And so now they have to build themselves up because they had also limited the size of their armies. So, you know, you could put pause and analyze these cartoons and you could see there was a lot of political art at the time, political cartoons showing the different, you know, Hitler. Here you see Hitler just playing with different people, right? Playing with different countries and taking taking land. Um, the second image shows the increasing pressure, right, of Hitler on Austria and Czechoslovakia and then other lands, right? How eventually, you know, if France and Britain think that this pressure is not going to reach them, they're mistaken. Dr. Seuss even got in on the action, and, you know, there you see the appeaser. So this policy of giving Hitler what he wants in order to avoid war because the Europeans had been exhausted from World War I is called the policy of appeasement. And so here you see Dr. Seuss showing the appeaser, which is supposed to represent Chamberlain, handing out to these sea monsters, which with the swastikas you could easily tell is representing Nazi Germany. Right? Remember, just one more lollipop and then you all go home. Right? Kind of like you keep handing Hitler free passes and you think he's going to go home. Right? He's just going to come back for more. Um, in that second cartoon, he, he, calls the, he, he shows the appeaser as a sideshow in a circus, right? as a guy with no guts. Right, he has no guts to stand up to Hitler. Right, here's another one of his drawings. Right, and you can see the that sea monster with the little mustache, so you know who that represents. And the appeaser, I believe, is thinking, "Oh, I, you know, I could appease him with my music." So one of the last stages in preparing for war was when Hitler forms the Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact in 1939, and that came as a shock to everyone because. Hitler been, had been talking this whole time about how much he wants to destroy communism. So it's natural that he's going to go after Stalin. But then it comes as a shock because he forms a non-aggression pact. Not an alliance, but an agreement that they will not attack each other. Hitler wanted to keep Stalin neutral when he invades Poland. So Hitler's planning to invade Poland, but he knows that if he invades Poland, Stalin, who's already paranoid and who knows Hitler wants to destroy communism will try to stop him. So rather than make Stalin feel nervous, he forms an agreement with him that the Germans just want one half of Poland and the Soviets could move into the other half of Poland. Right, so this was an unlikely alliance and an unlikely wedding, right? Wonder how long the honeymoon is gonna last. And so this is what sets the stage up to the start of the war which is in, which comes in September of 1939 when Hitler invades Poland. Okay, so we'll cover that in section two. So hopefully you're able to address those questions, and I will see you at the next lecture.